If you follow the news closely, and guess what? One more candidate and decided to join the GOP presidential race, again, for the 2024 presidential election for America. And the name is Will Hurt, a former Texas congressman. And here's a reason why he decided to join the race. And I quote, I'll give us the common sense leadership America so desperately needs. Common sense leadership. Does America today actually need someone who can offer the common sense leadership? Well, we'll see. Well, speaking of the common sense leadership, Minister of the State Anthony Blinken recently paid a short visit to Beijing, China. Now, during the exchange, not only he met up with the higher officials, and also he encountered the Chinese president. Now, both sides expressed the strong desire in terms of solving this deadlock relationship and believe that mutual conversation and also constructive conversation could actually bring a lot more healings than wounds. But meanwhile, at the same time, current Prime Minister Miranda Modi actually visited the United States of America and also reached a great deal with the country as well. And last but not least, what is going on with the war in Ukraine right now? Is someone ready to take the sword under Vladimir Putin? Well, in this episode, we're going to talk about all of them. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great honor to invite back our distinguished speaker, who is Professor Mark Lenton. Again, Professor Lenton teaches in political science, including international relations, comparative politics and security studies, and also comparative political economy. Well, Professor Mark, and welcome back to The Missing Piece. Thank you. Great to be back. Well, it's so exciting. Again, I want to start with the trip that Anthony Blinken took to China. Now, I want to read something to you. I want to get your reaction, Professor Mark. Some believe the American leadership today is no longer a practical and a tangible strategy. Instead, it is just one simple idea. China, by contrast, is ready itself for a world defined by disorder, asymmetry, and fragmentation, a world that in many ways has already arrived. So based on what I just read to you, what do you make of the whole visit between Anthony Blinken and the Chinese officials not too long ago? Well, there's a traditional Chinese saying, and it's very often been applied to current Sino-American relations, uh, same bed, different dreams. Mm. And I think this visit really kind of illustrated the fact that even though both parties are interested in finding ways of cooling down the tensions, the methods uh, by which to do that are really starting to differ. And this visit really magnified those differences. Now, Mr. Blinken made quite a few references to the idea that the United States and China are in competition, Mm. but that this competition should be uh, a responsible form of competition. This has not been accepted by the Chinese side. We are seeing signs from Beijing that there are still a lot of concerns that what the United States really wants with China is to contain Chinese power. And this has been a concern at least as far back as the 90s. This was very much reflected in the dialogue about comments by Chinese officials that the United States needs to recognize Chinese power, Chinese interests, and that there needs to be an understanding which recognizes uh, China's very distinct role in the international system. Now, not helping matters shortly after the visit was uh, comments made by President Biden, specifically referring to President Xi as a dictator. Mm. And that certainly did not uh, help the situation very much and might have actually undermined any results uh, from the Blinken meeting. Mm. Well, again, Professor Lenton, as we look at this uh, deadlock between the U.S. and China, again, as we mentioned before, some people believe that the world is actually entering a phase of disorder. But despite the phase of disorder, China could be best placed to prosper. So in other words, China, on one hand, love to see the whole world is not playing by the rules simply because based on our last conversation, it's rather difficult to demand China to follow the rules economically speaking and also politically speaking. But meanwhile, again, as we mentioned before, during the state visit, Anthony Blinken's actually raised a lot of critical issues, but based on the Chinese reaction, it's still believed that constructive communication, uh, a, a meaningful engagement. But meanwhile, China made crystal clear those fundamental rules or those fundamental issues should never be compromised, no matter what who is sitting on the other side 
off the table. So Professor Lenton, I want to get your reaction. Is China actually growing or prospering despite the fact that we are li living in this phase of disorder, not only for the U.S. and also for any other countries? My diplomatic response would be we probably need to wait and see a bit longer mm -hmm. in terms of how China's power is going to develop in the post-COVID situation. Now, China's had more than two years in near isolation because of the pandemic. We are seeing a lot of attempts by Beijing now to restart several diplomatic and uh, international initiatives economic ones, I should say. Mm. That includes getting the Belt and Road uh, back under full operation. This is taking place at a time where the Chinese economy is really starting to show cracks. There is a lot of concerns about slowing growth, perhaps even some sort of double dip, maybe not recession, but slowdown. Mm. And this is certainly causing quite a bit of nervousness that there was a lot of hope that China would be a major driver of the post-pandemic uh, global economy. That may or may not happen. However, China has, uh, Chinese officials have said, okay, we are ready to return to the international system. We are ready to develop new partnerships in many key parts of the world. I could point to, for example, Latin America, the Gulf region, the Middle East. So there is the interest in China's part to make sure that it is able to restore uh, the economic power that it had pre, uh, pre pandemic. And it goes back to what I said before about worries about containment, that the United States is not interested in any kind of coexistence, but rather interested in containing Chinese power, including economic power. When we talk about for the U.S. to handle the tension between China and uh, the current uh, uh, administration, last time that Professor Mark, you used the word interestingly called de-risking. How much do you think that U.S. today is still playing this de-risking game? after the short visit by Anthony Blinken, because we know today de-risking can be interpreted in many ways, especially from the Chinese perspective, but the U.S. really need to re-strategize its own steps in order to be ready for the next relationship or for the new phase with China. Again, going back to the same question, Professor Mark, is America today still running on this de-risking strategy or it is time to come up with a brand new approach or brand new step in order to counter, in order to be ready for the new relationship with China? Yes, it's been interesting following kind of the pattern and in some cases some of the language that was being used. At the beginning, it was talk about decoupling essentially separating uh, the American and Chinese economies. Mm -hmm. Then reality of sorts was said to have kicked in. We're talking about a relationship that is worth hundreds of billions of dollars mm. uh, per year. It simply can't be severed without considerable impact on all sides. De-risking reflects the idea that, okay, uh, even though we cannot obviously separate the two economies, is there a way of redistributing trade and investment to reduce risk for the United States? And this is the question now. Certainly, as we're heading into election season, as you said at the beginning, there's going to be quite a bit of discussion about China, quite a bit of discussion about American economic uh, independence. But the fact is, there is going to be cases where the U.S. and China will have to continue to maintain a uh, very strong trading relationship. Both have interest in keeping the global economy afloat. Both have interest in making sure that trade is not seriously derailed, especially with a lot of uncertainty in the global financial system right now. So we talk about de-risking, we just look for ways to remove mm. uh, any outward threats to the American economy, especially as we head into the uh, election season. Mm. Speaking of election, now, based on the research, only 15% of Americans think the current administration has been too strong in this China policy. But history tells us that such shares can grow rapidly, especially if economic situation is getting tougher and tougher. Now, Professor Mark, how much do you think that President Biden should do more while dealing with China? So in other words, what kind of attitude should current administration should hold or even uh, perhaps the next president uh, should change the strategy with China? Is it too strong to China or it's time let's take a step back and to soften the tones and again both sides 
none of the sides would like to see the collapse of the relationship. What do you make of that? I think that one starting point, um, Mr. Blinken's comments about responsible competition. Now, again, that could be taken as a buzzword, but I think there are some elements of important policy in there. Mm. The understanding that there are areas where the U.S. and China are going to need to cooperate. And I would say top of the list is issues related to environmental insecurity and climate change. I mean, that is simply the understanding that both countries have a very strong stake in that area. I mentioned the issue with global economics, the mutual interest in making sure that the international trading system remains afloat. And I would also say that there is also plenty of possibility of cooperation when it comes to areas of global security, even though we are obviously dealing with differences of opinion, especially for talking about the Asia Pacific. So I think there needs to be a recognition that there are areas where the two parties can sit down, the two parties can at least maintain a dialogue. And I worry that with the upcoming election season, there is going to be a lot of pressure on some candidates that it's to get tough with China, to stand up with China. And we won't see the kind of kind of nuanced discussion about, okay, how this uh, cooperation process should go forward. Mm. Professor Lenton, I want to move on to the next part of the conversation regarding the current Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi's uh, visit to the U.S. Again, as we mentioned before, this is also a critical relationship between U.S. and India at this moment. I want to, again, read something to you. I want to get your reaction. Experts believe that by seeing Modi's visit to America, India is sending a quote, a message to the U.S. that needs to choose between preaching to India or engaging India. Some believe the U.S. has realized it would be sacrificing the geopolitical unity of the Indo-U.S. relationship if it decides to castigate India. Your thoughts? Yes. India has really demonstrated over the past two years its commitment to, you would practically call it non-alignment on several fronts. On one side, India has been a part of very ambitious American-led plans to create new security architecture in the quote-unquote Indo-Pacific. India is part of the Quad along with uh, Australia, Japan, and the US. And mm. there's been much discussion about better integrating India along with other American uh, friends and allies. And yet, let's look at the other side. India is a member of the BRICS, which mm. includes Russia and China. India has not condemned directly the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And we still have contacts between Modi and Putin. So India has really been trying to walk a very, very delicate line. And as you say, it has been very critical of the United States and the West of attempting to put forward its own view of the world, of the rules based order. Mm. And obviously, India is in a very good position now with um, the economic global economic situation being what it is to be a more attractive market to uh, not only the United States, but to Japan, to Europe, to many other parts of the West. Professor Mark, again, under Modi's leadership, now let's piece, put another piece of reality into our conversation, again based on research, India has passed the discriminatory laws that alienated nearly 200 million Muslims. So in other words, some people believe that by welcoming Modi into the White House, it actually says Biden administration does not care about human rights in India if they did. There would be no absolutely ways they'll be hosting Narendra Modi right now. Again, we know that politicians can be controversial, especially in terms of policy, in terms of, again, all kinds of uh, obstacles. But again, articles came out article to criticize, and believe me, even some members did not actually attend when Modi addressed the Congress simply because that they believe he violated human rights towards certain religious groups or ethnicity uh, in the country. Now, Professor Mark, I want to get your take. How much does it matter actually at this moment when we look at this geopolitical change between U.S. and India today? And should Biden actually condemn this human rights violation behavior under Modi today? Your thoughts? Yes, the, the Modi government has just justifiably been criticized on several fronts, not only for the laws that you describe, but also concerns about press, press freedom, concerns about populism, and just concerns that the country is starting to shift much more towards some sort of authoritarianism. And this is obviously a concern to many governments. And yet, 
The United States views India as a necessary counterweight to China, as an anchor to any sort of Asian security regime which the United States is attempting to put together. So it too is trying to walk a very a delicate line, but it is a problem, especially because India has not severed ties with Russia, that India is going to be a part of what is looking to be a very interesting meeting of the BRICS group in the next few weeks, which will again include China, Russia, and many potential new members of this organization, which is a whole issue right there. So India has made it clear that no, we are not going to become a completely aligned to the West. No, we are not going to completely follow the US line when it comes to various areas of security. And it is going to pose a question for the American government, the current one and the next one about, okay, what is the line that we need to draw when dealing with India under Modi? I want to bring our conversation again, wrap up this session by asking you the last question. Currently, according to the number, nearly 5 million Indian Americans living in the U.S. Again, by looking at this 2024 presidential race, which again, Reddick started in many ways, we've seen a lot of candidates, either they're criticizing China or they're again seeing China in different ways, of course, that again, having or uh, witnessing uh, the Modi's visit to the US. Now, Professor Mark, how much do you think that actually by having Modi in the White House, uh, again, have dinner and also have this relationship solidified with Joe Biden, it could actually help the Democratic side when we talk about the presidential election. So, so in other words, do you think that those 5 million in Americans are actually going to become the voters for or even the believers for the Democrats, but instead of going with the Republicans? Yes, it is going to be very interesting to see how that kind of polling data works out. Now, it's it's been almost a truism in American politics that foreign policy rarely wins elections, and there's only been a few kind of exceptions to that rule. Mm. Nonetheless, there is going to be a lot of discussion about um, the United States' foreign policy direction, with the Asia-Pacific being front and center along with the uh, Ukraine question. So I would say that how the Biden government and how uh, the Democrats are going to have to adjust to kind of the difficult uh, situation with India, the difficult situation with Indo-Pacific security is going to be a key area, especially with that uh, particular section of the electorate. Well, again, uh, Professor Mark, I want to shift to the last part of the conversation. Again, just in case anyone forgets, hey, listen, the war in Ukraine still continues and based on the latest updates that the Wagner Group, and again, a call for an armed rebellion overnight and warn in a video that he and his troops have taken control of the military headquarter in the key Russian city. Of course, this actually drawed attention from the leader of Russia, which is Vladimir Putin, and to say the armed mutiny was a treason and a mortal blow to the Russia's troops. Professor Mark, what do you make of that? Because again, at this moment, everyone believes that Russia is doomed to fail. And of course, initially, there shouldn't be a war between Russia and Ukraine. Ukraine. But meanwhile, we're still paying attention to the war. But right now, we begin to see the internal crack within this Russian government, despite the brutality of the war. What do you make of that? Yes, ever since the um, invasion last year began, there were questions about whether this would leave uh uh, the Putin regime vulnerable, that there would be some kind of fifth column, some kind of opposition force that is poised to potentially overthrow him. Now, that was waved off by saying, no, no, Putin has had more than 20 years to consolidate power. He simply is not able to be threatened that directly. And that was pretty much the common line up until just a few days ago. Now we have an organization, the Wagner Group, which officially is independent, but we all know it is obviously Russia backed. We know have Wagner Group in open opposition to the Russian military and to the Putin government. Uh, Evgeny Rogozin has um, very much said, uh, Rogozin, I should say, has said uh, that he is uh, very much against now what has been happening in Ukraine, that how Russia has conducted the war. And he has apparently captured some key facilities and is now directly threatening the Russian regime. This would not have been predicted a short time ago. Mm. So it really would seem to suggest, first of all, that Putin is a lot more vulnerable than we thought just a few weeks ago. And it also demonstrates the frustration that we're starting to see in military circles all around about the complete lack of success of the Russian military. It's been 16 months. Very little has been accomplished uh, in recent months from the Russian side. 
Ukraine has begun a counteroffensive. It's been back and forth and still very uh, undecided, but nevertheless, it is taking place. And hopes in Moscow that Western resolve would begin to crumble simply have not taken place. NATO has gotten stronger. It has a new member, Finland. It might get a new member again very soon, Sweden. Mm. So very little has gone right for Putin. And there may be the perception that his regime is now weak to the point where it could be possibly challenged. I want to wrap up our conversation again. Probably, Professor Mark, you've been asked too many times, say, are we going to see the end of the war? But let's ask that question in another way. America has been actively supplying a Ukraine regarding the weapons and also, again, the old military equipment. Now, if we follow your thoughts and follow your logic that Russian or Vladimir Putin begin to see the more vulnerabilities internally and also externally, is it time, or let me ask this way, is it still necessary for U.S. continue to support or supply uh, uh, all the needs for Ukraine at this moment? Or is it time for U.S. to take a step back because we are going to see, or hopefully more likely to see, the result of the war in Ukraine? Your thoughts? This is a very difficult question because, first of all, we need to see what is going to be the result of Ukraine's counteroffensive. So the next few weeks are going to be critical in that regard. Then I would add, well, let's just see what happens in the next 48 hours. Is this just basically a minor annoyance for Putin, this potential um, military action by the Wagner Group? Is this something which is going to be uh, put down very quickly? Or is this going to be a period of systemic weakness mm. within the Russian government and military system, in which case the situation with Ukraine might uh, change quite rapidly. The election season in the U.S. will also be a point. There's going to be a lot of finger pointing about who is standing up for Ukraine and who isn't. There is also going to be the fact that we are going to be heading into autumn and winter again. Things are going to get very difficult um, for Ukraine during that time. So there's going to be a lot of calls for the West, NATO, to maintain its resolve. Mm. So a lot of variables which need to be covered before we can get an answer to this. Mm, that makes sense. Again, we know that today, on one hand, everyone is very concerned regarding this geopolitical change around the world, and China is growing, and Russia is in this unpredictable situation. And also, meanwhile, U.S. is also standing at the crossroads when we look at this uh, political uh, polarization. But meanwhile, we always believe that at the end of the day, number one, Conflict should never be the answer to any problems or I would say any war. And then the second is there's no way that we can continue to see the innocent lives and suffer under such dictatorship and also under such brutal war. But last but not least, again, rumor on the street that U.S. has already extended invitation to many officials in China, including the Chinese current president, and hopefully that this relationship is going to be resolved soon, or perhaps that at least is no longer in this deadlock uh, uh, transition. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great honor to speak to Professor Mark Lenton. Again, Professor Lenton teaches in political science, including international relations, comparative politics, comparative political economy. Well, Professor Mark, thank you so much for taking your time to be on the show. Again, every time we speak to you, it's always helpful and also insightful regarding the international affairs. We'd love to have you back on the show as we continue to follow the progress for China and also the uh, uh, political change in the U.S. And most likely, we're going to see some results regarding the war in Ukraine very soon. So again, thank you so much for doing this.